Our next guest is a Canadian artist and teacher. He divides his time between Vancouver, British Columbia and Los Angeles, California. His working studio is in the Commercial Drive area of Vancouver. While he generally works in oils, acrylics, and watercolors and inks, he is also a skilled sculptor. His artwork is primarily representational, and he has experimented with many different styles over the decades of his career. His most recent series of paintings, The Dark and the Wounded, represents a visionary fusion of expressionism and social consciousness. It's an immersive artistic experience. His paintings are showcased in some of the world's most troubled locations like abandoned prisons and asylums. His successful global tour opened in the infamous Alcatraz prison. Considered one of Canada's most foremost painters, he is well known for his extraordinary artistic range and mastery of many styles. He is also an extremely prolific artist and is known to work on as many as 20 pieces simultaneously. He has won many awards for his work over the course of his nearly 40 year career. Harold Town once commented that Picard's talent is rare in the art world. In addition to his artwork, he has close ties to Hollywood. He's worked on numerous films and television shows, including Tim Burton's 2014 Big Eyes. He is also the subject of a documentary, James Picard, Off the Canvas. Some of the celebrities he's worked with over the years are also collectors. Throughout his adult life, he has been devoted to philanthropy and humanitarian work, particularly children's health and welfare in Vancouver, Los Angeles, and New York. His latest film project, The Dark and the Wounded, will be on Netflix in January 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, James William Picard. George Bernard Shaw once wrote, He who can does, and he who cannot teaches. Well, obviously that's not the case here with our, our guest today, James Picard. James, thank you for uh, hey, my inviting pleasure. us into my your pleasure. space. I really appreciate it. No problem. So obviously you, you teach here in, in Vancouver. What advice do you give to your students and uh, what have you learned from them? I, I think my, my whole thing about teaching is about um, long ago the, the masters used to, I mean, they work, they uh, you know, hone their craft and they would pass all that information to their students. And I think, um, you know, with the whole monetary value of art, you know, um, artists are very isolated and everyone's trying to get their piece of the pie and not everyone's sort of sharing that. My, my whole philosophy with teaching was to uh, elevate people, uh, well, sort of open the door. Just I wanted to just provide a door mm -hmm. and open up and go, here's everything you can do and here's you know, here's the techniques to do it. Here's what you need to do it. However far you want to go in the door, you can go in the door. And um, mainly everything I've learned in, in my decades and decades of, of painting, I, I just like to instill in the students. And um, myself, because I'm super obsessed with painting, um, it, it's really good for me to interact with other artists as well. And, and that... Um, uh, it refreshes my memory too uh, about going in and working with different techniques and and um, it keeps teaching them keeps me striving to learn. What would you say is your favorite like, form of art? What's your favorite medium? Or do you um, not have a favorite? Like kind of like your kids, you kind of love them all the same. Well, I don't love them all the same, but I, I work in every single medium. Um, my favorite is oil. And um, it's just the way it flows. There's, uh, there's an essence to oil that I just love mm -hmm. and a smell. <laughs> um, but he, depending on what I'm drawing or painting, like whatever image is in my head, that's, that will determine what medium I need to use. Um, so I don't necessarily sit, okay, I'm going to paint in oil. Sometimes the, it's the image that will dictate what medium I'm going to use. But I, I like them all. I'd say my, my favorite is oil, probably followed by... You know, uh, pencil, watercolor, I don't know. I, I kind of love them all, but oil, top, yeah. Your new series, The Dark and the Wounded, um, is showing basically all over the world, yeah. or has shown over the world. It's, uh, it's pretty, like the title says, pretty dark. You, you've shown it in some pretty, uh, I don't know, dark places, yeah. venues, like um, abandoned prisons and asylums. Yeah. Um, how did that whole experience, or how has it um, affected you spiritually or mentally? Um, how do you take on something like that and not have it affect you? Do you it, can you separate the, your work from your home life kind of thing? Or? Um, no, I don't really have a home life. <laughs> but um, uh, no, the, the dark moon really affected me. Because in the beginning, 
it was it was sort of more like a exploratory investigation into um, what wounds we have inside us like wh why do we behave the way we behave as human beings and why do we put on f certain facades to you know protect ourselves wh what what are we, what are our fears and our darkness inside because I feel we all have that mm -hmm. and um, as I started painting it started as a uh, an observation thing and then it started I started internalizing my finding my own darkness and wounds which completely changed me and um, the first I guess few months when I started doing this I I went into this darkest pit like it was crazy uh, I had trouble like I got depressed is is I, I just sunk into I wanted to feel it and so I just went into some of the darkest aspects of my own psyche and the psyche of us as, as human beings and it, it totally it's it's totally affected how I've I'm not the same person now as I was when I started this five years ago that's probably why is that why some of the galleries didn't want to take you on this, this exhibit on or, um, you think yeah well I in the beginning they did want to take it on because um, they would look at it and go this is too disturbing mm -hmm. so you know no one's gonna buy this stuff and we want to sell and you know what's funny is now they're the most in demand most expensive pieces I have but at the time I wasn't really concerned about selling I was concerned about just I wanted to just get this out exactly. you know and, and exhibit it and um, yeah the galleries found it too too disturbing they well they thought the funny thing about galleries is galleries always think they know what's gonna sell mm -hmm. but no, no one knows what's gonna sell no one knows who's gonna walk through the door and um, you know, you can tell, you can say what has sold, but you can't tell what's going to sell. Exactly. And um, um, yeah, they just didn't want any part of it. But now it's funny, now that it's got all this recognition and I've done the film and um, yeah, it's gone globally and uh, I've won all these awards with it. All these galleries going, hey, show, we want, we want to show the work now. Mm -hmm. And I go, to, it doesn't belong in there anymore. I, I, that's what I realized as I was finding these new venues to show it in abandoned asylums and prisons and um, that's where the paintings belong. They fit mm -hmm. so perfectly there and I can't see them. I could never do this series or do this event in a gallery. I don't think it belongs there. Who, how did you come up with that idea? I, I originally, I had I think 15 or 20 paintings in the series and uh, hardly anyone who had seen them but everyone who saw them was, they would cry and they would get upset or they'd phone me and go, I can't get this image out of my head. and. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe I should exhibit it because originally I was just painting and just, I didn't care. I was just going to paint and mm -hmm. do what I love to do. And I got hired because I work in the film industry too. I, I don't, um, whenever anyone needs art, they usually call me. And there was a film they were doing at Riverview, it's so just outside Vancouver here, the asylum and uh, mental institution or whatever it's called. And, um, the main character was a painter and they were using it and he was in prison and so I did these drawings and when I wasn't needed on set I started wandering around the, uh, the building and I was just going what an amazing place because it's about dark and wounded this is where we put people when they're dark and wounded we don't want to address things and that's what we do here we put people in prisons or asylums because we don't want to address it and so I thought, oh, this is just a perfect fit. So then I went about trying to figure out how the hell to get into these places. And, and then we started filming it. And the rest is almost history. <laughs> <laughs> well, after it's all like said and done, when you finished all your work, did you come up with any answers or conclusions or any other ideas as far as the context of the, the subject matter? How do you mean, like, yes? It well, I read, uh, did you find anything out about why people like why society yeah. treats people this way or why people do the things they do well what what I sort of figured out was that as I was painting this part of my thought process was here here where as as human beings we've been on the planet two hundred thousand years whatever we still hate crimes racism you know homophobia we're, we're you know all this uh, violence and and destruction that we do to one another when we're all in the same species mm -hmm. it it didn't make sense to me like and I started thinking that you know as a 
as a young human, you know, when we're put together, we don't care if we're playing in the playground with someone whose uh, skin color is different or their religion is different. We just want to hang out. Mm -hmm. And I think hatred and homophobia and all these things are learned processes as we go in and we start to mold and we start to shape our way of uh, behaving based on what other people's perceptions are, as opposed to just our own perceptions. And then we start putting on this facade. And I think that uh, we need to go back to just allowing people to just be who they are. And, and it's okay to be who you are. It's okay to have wounds. It's okay that other people have wounds. And I think for me, one of the big things about humanity is I, I, I mean, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with the human race. Mm -hmm. I love certain aspects of it, and I love certain people in it. As a species, I think we're going down the wrong path. And um, I think what we need to do is we need to just understand that we're all in pain. Like, we're all, we're all on our journey, and we're all suffering. And the fact that knowing that we're all suffering should bring us together, mm -hmm. you know. And so what I'm trying to do is just get people in a sort of out of their comfort zone, um, because it's sort of like when you've got cancer or when you find out you're, you're, you're someone close to you has died, you have this, you start addressing your own immortality, your own mortality, and you start getting to what really matters. And all of a sudden, it doesn't matter that the guy cut you off. It doesn't matter that these two guys are holding hands. It doesn't matter anything because you're focused on what's important. And so the idea was to get people out of their comfort zone into an asylum or somewhere where they're uncomfortable so they can start addressing what's inside. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where I went with it. How important is empathy for an artist? It, do you know what, that's such an amazing question. Like, um, how important is empathy for an artist? It is everything. Mm -hmm. I think, um, as an artist, you have to feel, this is where we get our creativity. This is where I think if you, if you don't have empathy, um, you, you, you're drawing from very surface uh, um, inspiration. Mm -hmm. Empathy is what gets us that deep core inspiration. This is why, you know, great art and great masters, I think these people are all very empathetic towards everyone and, and the world in general. I think it's, it's crucial if you're going to be a good artist to, to be empathic. For it's sure. not just your point of view, it's kind of everybody's. No. Or just your subject, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. That's an awesome question. Because um, do you want? Sorry, I'm just going to interject for one yeah. second. Um, I think what happened. I think you know. W I call it the Picasso syndrome, but art became such a monetary thing where everything's about the money. Everyone's trying to make money and. And that, we lose that empathy because now we're just like everyone else chasing the dollar when artists should be on the forefront leading the way um, to make the world a better place, not just consuming like everyone else. Exactly. Yeah. And I find, yeah, if it's from the heart or if it's, if it's real and then you're not worried about trying to sell something, then it, it'll just happen. Yeah, right? exactly. People are looking for artists, yeah. I suppose, right? Yeah. Um, kind of change direction here. How did you get into film? Um, I stumbled into film. I've always been asked here and there to do um, work for film. Um, when I started going to Hollywood, um, well, back and forth to LA about 20 years ago, I started running into different people in the movie industry and people would say, hey, can you, you know, come on set or we need this or, oh my God, we need a portrait done for this scene or can you design this for us? And um, I started getting calls from people. And then um, just through word of mouth, um, people just started contacting me. And um, it, it's something that I, I enjoy the challenge. I don't know if I could do it all the time. Sort of like teaching, I can't do it. Take, I don't want to take away from what I'm doing, you know, my whole path, but um, that's sort of how I stumbled into it. Just running into people and then word of mouth and then it just kind of sort of kept growing from there. And, and um, with my own film, the documentary, it's um, the film is a great um, avenue to reach out to more and more people, you know. And uh, I was thinking with the Dark and Wounded as well. Um, not everyone can come to these events, so but it's tricky to try and capture that in film. But um, yeah, film as a whole, it's it's very interesting. I, I like film. Yeah. 
Talking about money, I guess, uh, how important is it for an artist to learn the commerce side of the industry, or is it, how important is that, and then, or do you think it's best just to find a partner that's kind of better at that than yeah. you are? Um, what do you do, sorry? Yeah, well, for me, it's funny because I, I've been painting my whole life, and I, I've struggled, and I've been homeless, and, you know, trying to scrape, you know, two nickels together to eat food, and, um, and there was times where I, I could have really used some business sort of, you know, marketing strategy. Um, I just sort of developed my own. I feel like um, I know my art best, and I sort of, you know, I market myself. Uh, but that being said, not, not everyone is, um, I'm sort of an extrovert introvert, mm -hmm. um, but not, a lot of artists just love to just hide away and create, and then the world doesn't get to see all that stuff. Um, the monetary value, though, I think it's, it's a tricky tightrope to walk because you, you have to be careful that uh, if, if you're, you can't be in it just for the money. It's mm -hmm. like you don't get into art or acting or filming for the money. You get in for the love of it. Mm -hmm. And once you start focusing on the monetary um, aspect of it, you can lose that whole uh, flow, you know, that whole flow of, of being an artist and what it, you know, that whole creative process because you're so focused on making money. I think mm -hmm. um, my advice to people was always um, learn to bend with life. Like, mm -hmm. Uh, when I made money, I lived in a house. When I all of a sudden didn't make money, I moved to a room. Mm -hmm. You know, I would just adjust my living because I'm an artist. As if you get in a creative field, it is like this. This is how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. If you want to go like this, then go work at the bank <laughs> or something because it's gonna you'll get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of artists I know they go, okay, I'm here. I got. But you have to bend because we we have good months and bad months and good years and bad years and and the whole thing is to just focus and paint and I think uh, when you were saying about the truth and this is very important to follow your truth mm -hmm. and when you do I think things will happen and when you start trying to fit that you know square peg in a round hole yeah, you run into problems because then you're chasing something mm -hmm. that is is non-existent you know mm -hmm. I think just focus on the art and if you make money off it and things happen, it's gravy, mm -hmm. you know. And but that being said, I think you can make money off it by just you know doing the. It takes time. It's a lifetime sort of approach. But you just keep getting better and keep getting your stuff out there, and and eventually things will happen. And now with the internet, it's a little more easier to. It's way easier now than it ever was. Yeah. You know, there's probably more artists now than there ever was. <laughs> yes. But I think when you focus, like if you all of a sudden sell a vase of flowers, you paint this vase of flowers, then, oh my God, I just saw Tuva, I'm gonna start painting vases of flowers. Well, then you kind of, li you're eliminating yourself, mm -hmm. you know, to what your, you know, uh, potential is. And you may start getting it, then you're gonna get great at painting flowers and vases, but art's much bigger than that. I think just embrace it and go with it. So you divide your time between Vancouver and LA. Uh, how's that help shape your career? Um, I think it's it's been so beneficial for me. Um, I mean, I used to live in New York. I grew up in Toronto, and um, the states, art has no borders. Mm -hmm. And I think the the problem with Canada is that there's a ceiling here. We don't one well, we don't get behind artists like like they do in America, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you can only seem to go so far here, and then it sort of caps. Um, Going to LA, all of a sudden, I realized there's there's no ceiling. You can go as far as high as you want to go. Um, it's sort of that American dream thing. Um, if you look at all the um, you know actors and people who are bands and people, it's you go to the states because you can go as far as you want to go. And I find that um, uh, even with the Dark and Wounded, uh, people would get behind the projects and, and things that I'm doing way more than people here and I think it's because of that sort of cap. It's this invisible ceiling that you kind of hit and you go, okay, this is far as I'm going, mm -hmm. you know, and so the states really open that up. I, I'm, and I love LA and it's nice and warm, but um, part of the reason I think I really love LA is, is it was created by creative people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's Hollywood, it's writers, it's uh, filmmakers, it's musicians, it's composers, all these people converged and I find that uh, a lot of times when I talk to people here, they're business orientated and th down in LA, they're 
it's some they're connected somehow. They're actors or they're they're connected to creativity or they're they come from creativity. Uh, they're just more aware and more supportive of the arts. So what needs to be done in Vancouver or Canada in general then to what would you like to see happen? I think that the big change that has to come when I first moved to Vancouver, I thought, wow, this has so much potential. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would connect with artists, but there was always this sort of segregation. There was no real camaraderie uh, that I felt in other places. Um, in LA, even when I had this project or I was doing shows there, people would say, um, hey, I know someone who can help you out, or oh, let me f help finance that, or, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone, would, hey, I know someone, who, a film guy, I know this, like, everyone's trying to pull together. If you're creative, like, let's work together as a team. And I don't feel we have that. We, we have great artists here in Canada, mm -hmm. but we're all sort of isolated and separated, you know? And this is, like I was mentioning, this is why I, I love what you're doing, because you're, you're opening these doors and allowing people to see who's here and connecting people, you know? And that's what is missing, I think, that uh, sharing, you know? It seems like, um, Everyone wants a piece of the pie here, and everyone's afraid to sort of share anything, you know. Uh, but that's what we need to do. Uh, I'm not threatened by other artists. I just do my thing. You do your thing. Everyone's doing their thing. I'm not. I'm not jealous or or uh, threatened by what you do because it's different. We all have our voice, and it's that's not a competition. It's not a competition. It a competition. And we need more artists. Yeah. I think you know we're outnumbered. Mm -hmm. The creatives are. We're outnumbered, and we're the ones who should be leading. You know, we're. We're being outnumbered by people who don't really get the bigger picture, mm -hmm. and artists, you know, tend to get the bigger picture. We need more of us. That's what I see. So, how would you describe the art scene here in Vancouver? Um, how would I describe that scene? I, I think um, first and foremost, it's knowing who's out there. And and you know, when I first went to LA and I meet people, um, there's groups, uh, you know, and the and the city did this too, where they opened up a section just outside Chinatown, LA, and, and they opened it up, uh, warehouses cheap, let's get all the artists in there, let's connect everyone, let's get this whole thing regentrified artistically, and I think we need to do more of that. Think less um, competitively and monetarily, and, and just connect as artists and, and, and work together, you know, in whatever way we need to work together, even if it's just inspiring each other. Well, talk about inspiration, what have you, what have you learned from working with like top artists like Harold Town, um, and artists like Francis Bacon, Pablo Picasso, Rembrandt, and Monet, like how have they influenced your work as well? Um, well, it's funny because um, I've really uh, strive in myself to be the best I can be, and um, I don't I don't know a lot of artists that paint everything and do everything and spend, you know. 48 hours painting straight and they're just obsessed and I love um, the masters who dedicated their life to art and I think um, it's it's um, I don't know if it's a choice but um, I definitely feel camaraderie with with the great masters of the past because that's they did what I'm feel I'm doing is I'm dedicating my existence on the planet to creating art and um, I just constantly want to improve and get better, and I don't think I'll ever achieve that. Uh, it, it's, you, you never arrive. You just, it's constantly, you're on that constant journey. And I think if you think you arrived, you're, you're screwed. You know, that's how I feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah it should be about the journey and the story. Yeah, and, it, and as, a, um, as an artist, you, you will run out of time. We, I, I, I will die. All these artists have tried to uh, understand the whole and grasp the concept of creativity and art, every single one of them has run out of time. They all die. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you just do it because of the love of do it and you sort of chase that and follow that journey. And some of the artists I've had the privilege of working with, um, uh, they did the same thing. It's that complete sort of dedication to art and, and, um, yeah, you just sort of give into it, and then eventually it sort of controls you, and you don't control it anymore, and it just dictates how you're going to live your life, and what you're going to do, and what you're going to spend your money on, and where you're going to be, or if there's a weekend, or if there's not a weekend, or if you're celebrating Christmas, it, the art will dictate all that, and that's how I live my life. <laughs> well, you have many different styles, and like, do you have like a common bond between your styles? Or how would you describe it? And um, I know some artists might just have a niche. Yeah. Well, you, you're kind of... 
Yeah, I'm kind of messed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what goes on up here. It's it's pretty crazy. There's a lot of voices up there, I think, trying to pull me in all different directions. Um, when I was younger and I started painting, I, I, I remember going, oh, if I could just paint like my high school teacher. Mm -hmm. And then I'd surpass that and I'd go, oh my God, I'd go there. Oh, I, I'd pass by a gallery and oh, if I could just paint like this guy. And then I could do that. And then I'd just go, wow, look at Rembrandt and Monet and all these people. Like, and, and they've all got something. And so I wanted to really understand. So I started copying masters and studying masters and you know what made them tick and what techniques did they use and I just wanted to be uh, a master painter I wanted to be able to do everything and um, it, it led into this mass obsession what I would do sometimes is I would work on a series like I did the series of cats once and I I did like 500 in the series and they're all kind of like oh that's the cats and then it's gone and I'm onto something else completely. Um, I know in the last decade or so, I think I've I've gone a little crazy because now I, I'll just jump now. I I never used to be able to jump between mediums, and styles, mm -hmm. but now what I'll do is I'll set up like you know six easels and I'll just jump from one to the other and one's kind of abstract and expressionist and one's hyper realism and one's this and I'm just my mind is working so fast. I feel like. Um, as I get older, I feel like that I'm I'm moving faster, like the speed is, you know, I was at you know 20 miles an hour, now I'm at 180 miles an hour, and it just keeps going, and I, I don't know if that's because uh, I'm getting older, and you know the end is coming eventually, or but it seems like I I just um, it's coming faster and faster. Well, you, well, your skills are probably at top notch yeah. too, like compared yeah. to like maybe. Um, my old assistant, I remember he said, uh, there was that book or something saying, oh, once you do 10,000 hours, yeah. you've mastered something. And he tried to figure it out since, you know, I've been working for decades, you know, over four decades. He goes, man, you're, you're probably over 100,000 hours or something crazy like that. And I, I think, um, yeah, I'm definitely confident what I can do. My skill level's there. Technically, I can do lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just, um, yeah, I don't know. I get, I get these sort of images, and each image is different, and it calls for something else like this. I don't even know where this painting came from. Like all of a sudden, I'm in the 18th century, and then mm -hmm. I wake up the next day, and it's 1960, and I'm doing something else, and I don't know. Well, it's good to have that tool belt where you can just reach in and grab that tool. Totally. That thing, right? So you're pretty you have a wide <laughs> range of skills. Yeah. Well, you mentioned before. Well, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, I think it's one of the reasons why I don't get uh, pigeonholed into something. Mm -hmm. I never get bored either. Like, I'm not going, okay, I'm, do, I'm the guy who paints the three trees in the river. Mm -hmm. You know, I do everything. And so, and I don't care. Like, I'm just doing it for me for the most part, unless I'm being commissioned or whatnot. So, um, yeah, I'm having a hell of a time. I love it. Like, I just get to paint and do what I love, <laughs> you know, and I don't care. Right? Like, I'm just doing my thing. It's literally burying yourself in your work yeah burying yourself in your work yeah just it's gonna all collapse on you when <laughs> no, I know <laughs> you're slowly getting claustrophobic <laughs> yeah. you know, I used to be able to see all the walls when, when I first moved in here yeah. that's a good sign well uh, you said you, you do a lot of commissions um, yeah so that's probably wise because you, you're able to do so many different commissions. yeah I mean the um, because I can paint in any style it's funny when people come into the studio they go how many artists are here and I go, it's just me. <laughs> and uh, but the funny thing is, I mean, because I can paint any style, like someone who doesn't like something like this might like something like that. So I mean, people buy a lot of pieces because um, they have the variety. And and going jumping back a little bit to the movie, um, when movie set people would come in in the beginning, they just come in and go, oh my god, one stop shopping. Yeah. You know, we can do this like this film that I just did. Um, with my friend Sarah Deacons, she, the the film itself, um, the location was an art gallery, and they needed forty different pieces of all different styles. So well, I'm your guy because I do everything, right? So you're kind of like a, a studio musician. Yeah. Where you can play yeah. any style. Of music yeah, I can play any style music. Whatever band comes yeah. in that day, or you can. Yeah. yeah cool. But I kind of think if if you love music or you love art, you you kind of want to do that anyway. You mm -hmm. want to explore everything. You want to test the waters in, in all mediums and styles so you know and it's um, yeah that's that's what keeps I think uh, 
keeps me inspired and keeps me loving what I do. I, it's funny after you know 45 years or whatever of, of painting, um, I still feel like a kid at Christmas, like mm -hmm. a blank canvas. I'm I'm just giddy, you know. It's crazy. So after all that, any advice for a local or upcoming artist? Um, well, I think my advice to to artists would be just follow your truth. I think, and, and that's, um, that's advice, I think, in any sort of field. Like, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and you know your path and your truth. If you start living your life for galleries or for what people say you should do, or I, it's funny because I always found that everyone who told me I can't succeed as an artist, none of them are artists. Mm -hmm. Everyone was a business dentist, lawyer, this, and they go, oh, you can't, you're going to starve. And... Um, I think you have to follow your passion and your truth. And when you do, and you're on that path, things happen. When you're not, it gets tougher and tougher. So I think uh, find out what your truth is and what you truly want to do, and then follow that. And don't worry about the mainstream. Don't worry about um, you know listening to other people or li living your art career uh, from someone else's perspective. Just live it for yourself. You know. I mentioned earlier, like. The trying to create a community in, in the city of artists that we should be helping each other and uh, I just want to give the hats off to Bernard he, he's uh, definitely he's one of the guys in the city that's trying to bring people together and, and showcase different people and stuff and uh, yeah, yeah that's kind of why we're all here right now <laughs> totally he's, <laughs> he's amazing yeah. he's, a, he's a conduit this yeah. guy you know and um, it's funny he makes things happen he just mm -hmm. brings things and it just and that's what we're missing. Yeah, is, we need is, more people like that. We more, totally more do. More events like, like that. Like, yeah. Like tomorrow night, you're, we have a showcase now at the Chalo Rossi yeah. uh, Art Gallery. And uh, we're going to see some of your pieces from uh, Dark and the Wood. From Dark and Wood. I'm, I'm putting a whole range in there. You know, it's funny, I haven't really shown a lot over the... While well, mainly I've been running around the world filming um, and doing commissions. And I, I haven't done a lot of shows. I sort of... Um, yeah, I just kind of stopped doing that for a while. I do little shows here and there, but nothing major. So this is really exciting to just sort of do a whole range. And, and um, like you said, Bernard is this conduit. He's bringing everyone together, which is fabulous, mm -hmm. you know. And and again, kudos to you for opening that door. It's all about opening the door because we, we, we're so isolated. And I think we get caught up in life and we don't realize what's right in our own backyard or, you know, who's behind this door. And, and once we know that, we start to realize, oh... I can do this too, and it allows, it gives us permission, I think, you know? Well, I know, like Sean and I, we um, help each other. I think it's, it's great to get a good team going, I guess. And have, do you have anybody that uh, helps you or helped you along the way, or do you have a team of people? Um, well, I mean, I've, oh, sorry. Um, n yes and no. I mean, I've got supporters and fans. I've had uh, um, different um, assistants over the years. Um, I have a few sort of backers sort of that will help me out here and there, but for the most part, I just, uh, I think I'm too crazy and too focused. Mm -hmm. I just kind of do everything, you know? <laughs> um, and, but I'm open, I'm open to, you know, connecting with, with everyone. And I think um, um, as an artist, my whole thing is about bending. It's like life, you're just bending and, and being open. Sometimes I found when I was with certain galleries or under contract, um, they would try and control yeah. certain things and for me I like that freedom of just not knowing what's around the bend mm -hmm. and just being open to it and not having someone say well you can't do that or you know this business wise it's not going to work out um, so even though I do have people I think in the peripheral helping me mm -hmm. uh, for the most part it's just me plowing, plowing ahead. Would you say do you have any weak points? Yeah part of my weak point I think is that I'm obsessed yeah. Because it, it overrides everything. And sometimes I'm, I take on too much, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm doing film and I'm doing this and I, I take on too many things, I think. Um, I think, um, um, no, I mean, I, I live my life for my art. So yeah. I, I, feel, um, I feel I'm on the path. Um, I'd say if, if anything, maybe um, uh, my weakness would be I, I just move too quickly. Sometimes I don't slow down enough to, you know, even look what's been happening. Sometimes I'm just on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. I'm very project driven, you know, so I'll, I'll do the film. And then if I'm not doing the film, I've got to do something else 
or even when we were waiting to get into Alcatraz, and Alcatraz took me years of negotiation to get in there because no one has a show at Alcatraz, and it's, they were so adamant, nope, you're not getting in here, there's no way. So it took me years to negotiate, and I wasn't giving up because I'm so stubborn. Yeah. Um, but even when we're waiting, I'm going, okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing another project, I'm doing this, I have to keep busy all well, That's time. a good trait, though. Stubborn can be a really good trait, but it can also be a weakness, I suppose. Yeah. I'm very stubborn as yeah. well. And uh, it can get me into trouble sometimes. Yeah, it gets me into trouble sometimes <laughs> too. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm determined. And it's funny when, and I was uh, with Alcatraz. I was just spending so much money and and flying to uh, San Francisco and just and everyone's saying, okay, look, it's been two years, <laughs> you know. And I go, no, no, I'm getting in there, no. And just and then people started abandoning me, just going, he's crazy. Yeah, this guy's just nuts. He's not getting in there. But then I get in. They go, "Oh man, you did it!" You know, it's stubbornness and perseverance. Yeah. You know, He's gonna, well, prove somebody wrong, I suppose, too. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I'm like that too. I, I think my father, when I was younger, was not very supportive, and so um, I was always determined. Like I was gonna, no one's gonna stop me from doing this. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm too stubborn. I think I guess maybe it's good to have a chip. Yeah, I think so. It drives you. It drives you, right? You know, and if I don't know, I can't give up. If I have some, if my, if someone tells me it's impossible, then I'm, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's how we advance. I mean, that's how we broke the four minute mile or whatever, right? I mean, people say it can't be done, so then someone goes, I'm going to do it. Yeah. That's when the best things happen, I suppose. Yeah. So, lastly, uh, what's your favorite thing about Vancouver? Probably my favorite thing about Vancouver, it's probably the best place to live, I think. Uh, Montreal is a cool city, but uh, Vancouver has got uh, like nature, you've got the ocean, you've got the mountains. It's um, New York, I always thought was a, it's a people, it's a people energy. Mm -hmm. uh, Vancouver is a nature energy, and um, when you need to get out, it's you're 10 minutes and you're away, you're at the beat, you're at the ocean. Mm -hmm. You're in the mountains, you know, recharge, it's a, kind of yeah, recharge, and recharge, recharge yeah. totally. Does it inspire your work though? Um, yeah, I mean, what I, I love getting away, mm -hmm. you know, and I love getting out. I mean, the fresh air away from the turpentine, <laughs> breathing in air. Um, but yeah, I think Vancouver, is a, it's, it's a beautiful location and it's warm and you don't have these heavy winters and it's great. And the one thing about Vancouver is there's, um, there's again, there's this potential here. There's, there's great people here. I've met some amazing people and super talented, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where, again, I think it just has to more connectiveness and, uh, you know, allow that to shine. As Canadians, we don't, uh, we don't get behind things like other people. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Van Vancouver's a beautiful place, you know, mm -hmm. and you can always, I mean, whenever I'm flying around and whenever I come back, you smell it as soon as you get off the airplane. It's like, oh, there's that fresh air, you know, not that urine-stained <laughs> smell from Harlem or something right. in the summer. Well, James, I really appreciate you having hey, us. thanks, you know, James. Thanks for the compliments it. about our show. It really means a lot. Yeah. We're trying. It's fabulous. Thanks for having me. It's amazing. And great questions and uh, fabulous. What's your story, Vancouver? Our city, our stories. <laughs>